Hello everyone, thanks for coming. Let me move all of these amazing toolbars. Um, sorry, the wife's just running in the background. She'll try not to trip over. So thanks for coming. Um, a few of you may have seen this talk before. You may not have done. This is my talk about building APIs in Laravel and how you can kind of simply you know, build a simpler approach to scale when it comes to building Laravel APIs in general. So who am I? I'm Steve McDougall. Uh, you find me most places as just Steve King. Um, I'm one of those people who changed his last name when he got married. So if you're confused, that is why. Um, I started uh, this user group, PHP South Wales, well over two years ago now. Um, I've now handed the reins over to Ollie, um, who's got a lot more time than me with my five-a-side football team of children. Um, I organize conferences. A huge PHP and Go advocate. I'm quite obviously a bearded man, and I'm a self-employed consultant. So, the first thing I always like to talk about is where people go wrong with APIs, and what what people typically tend to do is they think they can just create all of their models, all of their entities, and just create a nice crud wrap around every single one and call it an call it an API. Um, for internal API, for internal APIs, that's perfect. You know, if you're if you're building a, an admin interface and you've got all of the logical bits in the background, testing all of the different um, authorization policies, that's fine. But what most people want is an API that's going to provide some level of value. So, when we start an API in Laravel, we've hit that point of no return. You know, we, we've started building our application and we want to open up this API and we've got hundreds of models in our app directory because our application is starting to get a bit complex. And if it's not in our app directory under that main namespace, we've moved it into the app models directory. So all we've really done is kind of lifted and shifted that problem to a new namespace. And we've got more scopes than a game of Call of Duty. So what I'm talking about there with, with Laravel and Eloquent is all of these different ways to filter down your query within your application. You know, and what a lot of the time I like to tell people is, you know, what if there's a better way? Can we not be a little bit smarter about how we're approaching our application instead of making these really, really big, heavy, eloquent models, which is which has got most of the business knowledge within it, within it already. So before we even start writing code, we start before we even start building that API, we've got this application, we've got all of these models. We, we know roughly what we've got going on already. And what we want to do, we want to move that towards uh, an API that's gonna provide value. So that means we're gonna to have to design this API. So the best advice I always give people is to design the API you actually want before you start building the API you don't need because before you know it, you add an endpoint after endpoint, which you're not going to use. So APIs, they're, they're more than just crud wrappers. Um, they, as a developer, it's so easy just to go, right, okay, so I've got, I've got 20 eloquent models. I'm gonna do a create, read, update, delete on all of my models and call it a day. That's, that's my API, great. I'm gonna walk away, I'm done. That's my job done. But then you start to fall into problems. You know, what happens if those models change or what happens if you don't want to allow access to certain parts or what happens if you want to be a little bit more controlled in your approach in your API? What happens if it's an open API or not open APIs in the specification? I saw Lorna smile for a second there. Um, what happens if we want to open the API up to the public so anybody can start working with it? Do you want to allow, you know, crud behavior on your API so easily and so simply, or do you want to design the API in the way that it's going to actually provide value to those people working with it? So what you'll see here is an example of open API, the specification. And what open API does, it gives a really nice, easy way in YAML, which might put a few people off, but you can do it in JSON, do not fear. Um, I prefer the YAML one personally. I don't get what the YAML hatred's all about. It's it's beautiful. It is a beautiful way to, to write this markdown language. 
Um, well, what it allows you to do, it allows you to start describing what your API is going to look like. You can provide your endpoints. You can give it a summary, the description. You can add all of the different parameters that you're going to add to it. And it allows you to properly describe and design that API in a really easy to read format. And what you can do with that then is you can share that with your team. You can go through a review phase. You can plug it into something like Stoplight Studio, start running some mocks and start testing against an API that you've not actually built yet. So you can start to feel where those teething points are in an API where you thought, this is a really good idea. I'll throw some code together. I'll test the endpoint, start working with my API. And then suddenly you realize, oh, wait a minute. I've done that bit completely wrong. I wasted, you know, an entire day adding all of this, you know, all of these endpoints, all of this functionality, and I could have just moved it over here a little bit more simpler, and it would have felt a lot more natural. So when we're talking about API design, it's all about a modern workflow, and this is an image I quite openly stole from Phil Sturgeon after he gave me permission when I found it. So I was, when I was planning this talk, I was going through the phases of how I do, how I go through and design an API. I went up onto draw.io, I started adding all of these boxes and these arrows. And if I'm really honest, it looked terrible. Um, so I had a look online, see if there was a better example of it. And obviously Phil Sturgeon had already published one. So I asked him if I could steal it and he said, yes. So what we're looking at here is thinking design first. You have the idea for your API. You plan your API, you go through the strategy, you go through what the audience needs are going to be, what the requirements are, and then you start sketching it out. You start to understand what is this API and why do I need to build it and what is it going to provide. We then move to that design phase and we go, okay, great. So now we've got a solid specification of what we want to be building and why we want to build this API. We can create the API descriptions. We can start testing them. We can start mocking them. And then we get feedback. And we're not just talking about the traditional stakeholder feedback of, right, I'm going to pass this up the chain. It can go to my tech lead. It can go to my CTO or whoever. It's sta stakeholders of people who are going to use it. This open API description is a YAML file. Anyone can download that. Anyone can run a mock against it. And anyone can start integrating with it. So what you can do is, if you're providing this public API, is if you publish that open API specification, people can start building integrations with your API before you've even finished building it if you really wanted to. Or you know, your internal mobile team or your front end team can start building their integrations and we're not waiting on you, constantly pestering you saying, how long are you gonna be? You were meant to be done two sprints ago. You know, it allows you to start moving forward and the front end team, the mobile team, they can start having input in that design phase as well. You know, it doesn't then doesn't have to be a back end decision on, you know, how the API should be designed. You can start opening that up so that you know it can be a collaborative effort. And then you build that prototype and code. Great, you've got your API, you've published your API, your open API spec is online. People can look at it, people can start working with it, you can start exploring it, but then you've got another feature. So instead of just adding the code and saying, right, okay, I'm done you go back through that process again, you start to understand what this feature is going to do, any changes it's going to have, you can start mocking it, and then you can start working with it and getting that feedback. So you're going through this kind of gradual kind of feedback loop of moving forward, but moving forward and testing your approach before you have to write the code and test the code. So it allows you to really step forward in a sensible way that everybody understands. So once you've built the open API specification, once you've designed that API and how you want it to work, you know, the next stage is domain modeling. Domain modeling is probably the, the most important part once you know what your, your API is gonna look like. It's about how your eloquent models are, are created, what attributes have they got? How do they relate to other, other ones? It, it's all about that, the, the data level and the architecture above that. So in, in Laravel, I always set up domains. And what, what I like to do, you kind of take a kind of a fake DDD approach. I mean, you can't 
follow true DDD when you're using eloquent because it's active record, but I'm going to say it anyway, I'm doing a DDD approach. And what it means that you're, you're splitting out the, the kind of the core context of your domain. So let's take a, a typical application of a, an auction site. It's probably, you know, you could have about 30 to 40 eloquent models in there and all of those controllers are all in the same place. Everything starts to get messy and things just start piling on top of each other. And yeah, you can use something like Xdebug or any of the amazing uh, debugging tools you've got when you're kind of trying to debug and work through your, your application. But then, you know, you debug it, it stops on the line, you go to the file and you go, okay, so the, we ran into an issue on line 1197 of this one PHP eloquent model. And I'm sure a lot of people have been there in the past, if not more recently. It starts to get very, you get a lot of kind of fatigue, code fatigue when you're looking at model at code like that. You see this file, it's like, great. I know it's in this file, you go to that file. And if you're in PHP Storm, if you're in VS Code and you see that file, yeah, if it takes a little bit too long to load, you just kind of, you hang your head and you just, you pray to the PHP gods that it's not going to be that bad. And then it loads and you realize it's, you know, it's got over 2000 lines in it and you have to scroll down and scroll down. Where is it? Then you find it and then you realize it's embedded in a function that's probably about 60 lines long and you just pull your hair out and you end up like this. Um, you lose your hair way too quickly. So setting up the domains means that you can, you can split all of this code out. You can start to have your, your, your models over here in this really specific place and anything related to those models all contained within it. So you can split things out nicely. So what we do is we start to make our models look a little bit like this. We have a class user, which would obviously extend an eloquent model, but I didn't want to make it look too messy. Um, so what we have, we've got a new eloquent builder. So by default, your eloquent model, when you start to build an eloquent query, you will create a new eloquent builder on that model. So you can start adding your where conditions. You can just say, or you can do a first, first or fail. You can start building up your scopes and how you're gonna really define the query that you're going for. So typically what you do there, you start to get your your, your user model, you, know, you, you want a where clause for where they're active or a where clause for the latest by a certain field, or you want to, to filter it even further. And before you know it, you've added five, maybe 10 new methods to this user model. Now the user model is, it, it, this eloquent model is meant to be a relatively thin layer of how all of this data is connecting. Do you really want to keep all of those different filters all of the different scopes and criteria of how you can build up a query bogging down your model or would you rather move that somewhere else so that's where this eloquent builder comes in you can create your own eloquent uh, user builder or eloquent model builder in this case and you just forward that query through so you're just returning the new user builder which will then allow you to register your own scopes in a very specified place and it makes tdd a lot easier and things are so focused because you know if you need to add a scope, if you need to debug a scope, or if you need to do anything to do with scoping your queries you on the user model, you know where to go. You don't have to worry about going through all of the different scopes on that one model. And again, with collections. So when you return more than one result, or if you're querying for more than one result in with Eloquent, you will return your standard eloquent collection, which will have plenty of convenience methods on it. Now, those convenience methods are absolutely amazing for most of what you want to do. But every now and then you actually want to maybe go on top of that. Maybe your, your collection or what you're typically doing is actually needing two, three, four of these methods chained. So what you do, you build another user, you build a user collection as a specific class, which you can then return the user with. So that means I've got 20 users all returning within this very specific specific user collection, a 
allow me to then start adding the bits of code that I actually want to use. So your builder class. So this is what your user, your, your user builder would look like. So instead of having to prefix everything with scope and then you know, having to remember that when you're going through all of your code and then not getting that um, ID helpers, you just add a nice, simple verified email returning yourself again as you're just chaining these things on. So, okay, so return this, where not null, email verified at. And it's very simple. Very, you understand what that is straight away looking at it. You know that, okay, so this is part of the query builder for a user and we want to know who's been verified. Perfect. Very simple to understand. And obviously you can add more. You can add more if you've got very specific um, ACL on your application and you want to find out, you know, get all admins or, or you want to get all editors, you can add these into here really simply and really easily. And what it also allows you to do, let's say you're, you've got an active field on more than one model, what you could do, you can start to pull in traits. So your, your trait can have a, uh, using the builder method, you can just say return this where the active column is true to get all active models. And you can just pull that into your builder and you can just pull that into all of the different builders that you actually need it. Meaning that you don't have to write the same scope for the same model again and again. So when we, we've gone through, we've designed our API, we've, we've modeled our domain, we understand how we can kind of clean up these eloquent models to make them maybe a little bit more reliable, less, more testable and less kind of, it doesn't give you any fatigue when you're looking at it. The experience of using it is so much nicer. So now we need to look at the, the root service provider. So in Laravel, we're very used to seeing something like this. We've got this, this, uh, this um, boot method where we're configuring our rate limiting if you're using Laravel 8. If you're not using Laravel 8, then you won't have the rate limiting, but you'll have something relatively similar in the boot method where you just say, okay, map the web routes, map the API routes. And when this example here, we're going, okay, so let's load these routes and we want to load the web routes and we want to load the API routes. But we're building an API here. Do we really need to load those web routes? And is that how we want to load our API routes? If this is just a, a API platform and you don't actually want to be you know, loading all the, all the web routes and then getting 404s or the, issue, the typical issue in Laravel where maybe you've not added the right middleware and then you get a, oh, sorry, the login route can't be found because Laravel occasionally throws you a curveball like that. Um, you can approach it slightly differently. And because this is in your web, your application is not in the framework itself you haven't got too many worries when it comes to breaking changes. So here's how I particularly you know, usually approach this. We will configure rate limiting, always gonna do that anyway. And then we jump into the routes. Okay, so I'm gonna drop that API prefix because I'm building an API. Why do I need my API to be prefixed with API if it is only an API? It, you know, to me, it makes no sense. So I'm gonna prefix it with V1. We're loading the, the API middleware so that we can kind of enforce some, some JSON responses on that one. And then we're going to group. But what we're going to do now, we're not just going to have roots slash API.php because we're going to start versioning our roots. We're going to have roots API as a directory and then start building our, our roots within the separate files themselves. So you can really understand them as you go through. And then again, the same would happen for V2, V3, and so on. And what you would do here, as you add V2, you would do exactly the same as what you've got there with uh, root prefix V1. You have prefix V2, load in the next root, and then you can start when you've got V2, you can go back to that V1, provide it as a redirect to V2, and just start to retire that old V1. There's your, your, your service provider. So, we talked about loading routes and how we're going to load these routes. The one of the more important things to me is JSON API. 
and middleware as an aside. So JSON API is, is a really great standard for when you're building any sort of API. You know, we, in, in the PHP language, we've got all sorts of PSRs, which are fantastic, definitely follow standards. And this middleware that I use here is, is a, a middleware to enable aspects of JSON API to be really easily added. So it is a properly it's been properly registered and the media type is application slash VND dot API plus JSON. So you can probably tell what I'm going to do here. We're going to make sure that our return type for the media is going to be JSON API consistent. So what we do, a very simple implementation is this will be an after middleware. And what we do, we will handle the next request. Then when we get that response, we want to start working with that response. So let's get the name that we're going to use. By default, we're going to call it API, but we can configure that specifically in the config or in EMV if you really want to. So you could have it as um, the return type being application VND dot Laravel or dot company name plus JSON. And it allows you to kind of put your mark on that bit a little bit. And then, so we build up that name string, get the response, append, um, modify the header for content type with application VND dot whatever we set the name to plus JSON, and then just return that response. And it keeps things consistent. This isn't something that you have to do. This is something I like to do. It's one of those kind of points of pride, a little bit like the different PSRs. Do you follow the PSR 2 or do you follow PSR 12 coding standards? You know, I like to keep things very clean and standard when it comes to APIs and coding in general. So for me, this is like one of those must haves. I want to keep things clean, consistent and very declarative. So if I need to change anything, I can easily do that within one middleware section. So what's it about? So here you'll see how GitHub handle their, their return types from their API. They've got application VND dot GitHub, and then they add the version in, in on that, um, on that media type, which is great. Um, but to me, it never feels right doing that in Laravel. And it, it's never, I've never found a nice way to add versioning through, through uh, HTTP headers working nicely in Laravel. If anyone has got suggestions for that, please ping me on Twitter. I would love to talk about how you approach this. Um, but we build up our content type by the type slash VND, followed by the subtype and suffix, and any specific parameters that you're going to go for after that but your basic one would be vnd.api plus JSON. So we've spoken about loading our routes and adding a nice little bit of middleware so we can kind of, we can return a JSON API consistent media type. So now let's talk, look at how we're gonna handle our routing. So in Laravel, there are quite a few different ways to handle routing. You know, it, it, it's given you lots of options. You can you know, define a specific um, endpoint and you can just find that within a special uh, controller and a specific method. That's kind of what I'd call your typical Laravel routing. You can then go down the kind of API resources where you say, okay, so root API resource for this resource, kind of just go to this resource controller and use the default methods which Laravel provides. You can add a, a third option as an array to say, okay, I only want to provide these specific ones and that's great, that is kind of that API resource approach. And then you've got the inv invocable controller approach where you say, okay, so I just want to go to the invoke method on this specific class. I just want to invoke this class and let that handle the routing. This is my typical approach. And as you can see, once your brain kind of gets over the, the, the dark and blue colors, this is the invocable approach. I, I like, going that invocable approach on my APIs and in my code in general, because it keeps it very consistent. There's nothing worse than an application starting to get complicated and you've got all of your methods in that one controller. You know, you've got your index method with all of the different things that you might want to check, all of the different validation rules, all of the different authorization rules, 
any any jobs you might need to dispatch or events you might need to be doing or anything else that you might be doing when you're handling a route in an API. And then, oh, look, there's another method and another method and another method. It just starts to get very kind of, again, much like your, your eloquent models, the fatigue of having to go through that code and having to look, you know, go through that method, this method, and then it all just starts to get messy. So this example, I am doing a Star Wars character resource. So this API allows you to have a look and manage basic CRUD behavior here on Star Wars models. And I noticed I spelled Star Wars wrong there, and I'm never going to live that down, but I'm a Star Trek guy. So we're prefixing characters and we're going, okay, so we'll give them a name. So we're going to say, okay, group these under the prefix of characters. And we're going to start the naming convention as Star Wars characters colon. So then we keep all of our roots nicely within there. So for that first get, we're going to go to app HTTP action V1 Star Wars characters collection action because we're returning a collection. So what we're doing here, I, I don't really call them controllers. I call them, I think I kind of got that from my time using slim PHP where I followed PSRs and roots were handled and which didn't fit into some of the different naming conventions in the Laravel world. So I kind of, I brought a little bit of my, the way that I write code in other languages and in other frameworks into Laravel and it's worked for me. So what we're doing here, as you could probably see, we're actually versioning not only the roots, but our controllers or our actions, how we're handling these roots, whether it be a closure, invocable, whatever that might be. And then we're adding that name onto the end of it. So we've got your, your typical get all of them, create a new one, get a specific one, update one or delete one. And what you do here, if you want to then start going into uh, sub resources, you add that within that set group there. So you've got these really nice chunks of where your endpoints are and how they've been defined. So now I've rattled on about how I like to handle roots, let's actually handle one and let's look at how that works. So this one is for a, a typical blog. Uh, we want to get all blog posts. So this is using a really useful package by Sparsi. Um, if you're in the Laravel world, you've probably heard of Sparsi. If you haven't, they're basically this Belgian company who do so much Laravel open source work and a lot in the Laravel community. And if you're looking for a way to do something, they've probably already open sourced a package. So definitely worth checking. The packages are typically quite high quality. So what we're doing here, okay, so we're going to do, a, we're going to use our package for query builder for the post model. And what we're going to do, we're going to allow the filters for ID, title, content, the slug on the author and the slug on the category. Then we're allowing the includes of author and category. We're allowing people to sort by the ID, the category name, author name, or created at. We're only interested in the published posts. And that's where we're jumping back into those those query builders on your eloquent models. That is a scope that we would create and it would just check a single, simple little query. There's one of those nice scopes. And then we just want to paginate those results. So what this is allowing you to do here, again, you're following JSON API. You're following it where you can start to add your filters, your includes and your sorts really nicely in through the URL. And you don't have to do lots of complicated checks or does the request have this? Okay, then do this. Does the request have that? Okay, then do this. I've looked at ways to do this myself manually. Um, and it would way too much work for me to even bother doing, you know, for the includes, yeah, it's fine. You could probably do a three liner, but for where you're allowing filters and sorts and the direction of a sort as well, it just starts to, it starts to get very messy. Push that off to a package and manage this nicely. You've got you know, less than 20 lines of code there. So easy to absolve, easy to understand what's going on. And then we're returning a JSON response. We're returning the post resource the, with a, of a collection and we're passing those posts through. <clears throat> and then what we do, 
we return a HTTP OK status code because this was successful. Um, so a lot of people here, what they would typically do is they'd either return the post resource as a collection on its own, or they'd re replace where I've gone response HTTP OK as just your standard 200 response code. And there's nothing wrong with that. But my the main problem that I have with that is if you if you're a more junior developer or if you're not as kind of clued up on your status codes, as your API gets a little bit more complicated and you want to return specific status codes, let's say um, HTTP accepted or a, you know, a modified response, or you want to return a created response, you know, unless you know those status codes off the top of your head, then you're going to be returning the, the, you know, the wrong status code. So if you get into the habit of returning that, that constant, which for this specific example, it's coming from the Symfony HTTP library, which is obviously a reputable source. It's not someone pulling your leg and trying to get you to return a teapot on every response. Um, so you can trust that and you know that you're going to be returning, in this case, a 200 response. And that's great. So we're returning a, a resource a collection. So what we do here is just a simple class, which will take that input and it'll morph it, well, transform it, much like uh, if you've ever used the any of the, um, oh, what's the package called now? Lost myself. Basically, it will take, it will take the, um, the response and it will morph the, the models into a very kind of specific way to keep returning it. Can tell I've been off work for too long. So what we're doing here, we're going, okay, so the ID is this. Here's the title. Here's the content of, of this post. Here's a created array, which will be turned into an object. And what I like to do when I'm returning dates is I go, okay, so here's a string version, but here's a human readable version because because the way Laravel return will give you a date, you've got these helper methods already, you've got an object. So do something useful with it. You know, you could re just return a nice simple date string and allow client side to then, you know, oh great, so I've got this, now I've got to morph it into a human readable based off of what time is now. But what you can do from your API instead is you can return that for for them because it's not going to take much effort and it's super useful. It means you don't have to worry about on the front end pulling in a JavaScript library to do date conversions, or you don't have to worry about how you're going to display that date. You can provide that consistency from your API resource itself. You've then got whether it's been published, and then you've got your two relationships. You've got your author or your categories. And what we're doing here, your author is a has one or belongs to in this case, sorry. And it's just returning a new author resource when we're actually loading the author, otherwise it's just going to be returned as null. And then categories, it's it's got, you know, belongs to many categories. So we're just going to do a category resource collection when the categories are requested, otherwise null. That's a simple, really clean and simple, easy way to return a response from your API. We could start to get a little bit more advanced and start to go down the JSON API route where we're giving it a type. We're giving it the ID where we're actually just going to reference the UID. And then we start to embed those attributes where we're saying, okay, so here's the ID again. Here's a title, the content we created and published or within there. Here's some relationships as an aside. And here's any additional links, which, you know, for this example, here's self. And what you can see there, we're actually referencing back to those named routes. So what a lot of people forget to do when they're building APIs in Laravel, when they're defining their routes, they don't add names. So we can't easily reference them back nice and quickly. So we can't use those helper methods to say, right, okay, so just get the, 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 the URL for post.collection, for example. So we actually got to manually add that in, which is, you know, it's not a huge amount of work, but then if URLs change, or if you you know go for a different naming strategy, it starts to get really messy. So really nice idea to add those names on when you're defining your routes, so you can add things like this. 
So we've, we've talked about, you know, that domain modeling, how we're going to load in our routes, how we'll define our routes and how we'll handle them, what we're going to return from our API. So, you know, it's not really going to be very useful unless people can authenticate and start using this API as an authenticated user and start creating things on your application and start actually interacting properly. So the few main ones available to you, you can go for your HTTP basic authentication. It might not be prop, you know, properly documented, it might be now, but the last time I checked the docs, it wasn't properly documented how to enable basic authentication. It is quite simple, you know, and some APIs, even some big APIs that I've used today, and I'm sure a few other people who regularly work and use APIs will agree, nothing overly wrong with HTTP basic authentication for certain circumstances. Then you've got the user-based token access. So that's where, <clears throat> let's say, I've got an application, you log into the web, you generate an API, it's more about kind of that personal access token, you've then got an API token, you can then start working with the API. Nothing wrong with that at all. We then we got something like JWT, which is maybe a little bit more traditional in, in the Laravel world at the moment, where you, know, you send a request through login with your username and pass, password. It will then check, see if that's, you know, that user exists, it'll generate the token or return the token. And then it will expect that token on every subsequent request to prove that that is you. Then you've got Laravel Sanctum, which is kind of the, the trimmed down version of OAuth. It's basically OAuth without the hassle. And then you've got Laravel Passport, which is that fully fledged OAuth 2 server within your Laravel application. You can do all the different magical things you can do with OAuth and people struggle with it, if I'm honest. I mean, the amount of people I've seen who struggle with Laravel Passport and how they should authenticate. Should I be doing user credentials or should I be doing a, um, a password request? Or you know, how should I be, what, which version of um, OAuth 2 should I be using to do this for my SPA or should I be doing for this mobile app or from this CLI application I'm building? Um, the best advice I always give people is use the, use the authentication that's right for you now it's quite easy to think, right, okay, let's just throw an OAuth 2 server on it because then we're not going to have to change anything and we'll just grow into it. But that's over engineering. You know, you need to use a, the authentication mechanism that you need, not the one that you think you're going to need in two years because you don't know where that project is going. That project could take a slight sidestep and could be something completely different. And then they drop the API and you've added all of this OAuth 2 stuff for no reason. And, just bogging down your application. You know, the way that auth works in Laravel with, with its driver approach is it's very easy just to kind of hot swap these things as you need it. Start with JWT, move on to Sanctum if you want to go cookie based and you want it to be still lightweight. And then if you really need OAuth and you're going to have other clients doing log into your application with this other application, fine, go for Passport. If you're going to use the full OAuth 2 weight, then use it. It is pretty good as a, as a package. But if you don't need all of that, don't make your life hard just because you can see lots of tutorials on using Laravel Passport in your API. You know, have a look what's available and take that sensible approach. So as with most of my talks, I give a quote, which I make up on the spot while I'm writing it, which I think sounds clever, I'll let you decide. So use the authentication that works for your needs, not the one you think you're going to need in two years. Pretty much just said that, but here's a quoted version. So basically what I'm trying to say there is don't try and use everything all at once. Use the bits that you know you're going to need now, what your requirements are. Don't start chasing that those shiny objects across the internet. And before you know it, you've spent three hours getting Passport installed and configured and working correctly when all you needed to do was, okay, let's just do HTTP basic because 
is only the occasional authenticated request that actually comes in. The traits. A lot of people don't like traits in the PHP world, but I think if used correctly, they can be quite beneficial. So in Laravel, they're really handy. They allow you to share behavior and keep your, you know, your objects relatively dry. And this specific one is one that I use quite often. And it is a UUID trait. What it will do, it will say, okay, so this eloquent model has got a UUID on it. But what I don't want to do is every time I'm creating this UUID, I don't want to start going, okay, so let's pull in, you know, Ramsey UUID library, create the UUID manually and just attach it again, because you're just repeating yourself there and you're pulling in a library here, pulling another little class in here, 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 and you just, it's a waste of time. Push it off to a trait, especially in Laravel, the way that Eloquent works, if you weren't aware. So, the trait name here is has UUID trait. On an eloquent model, if you prefix the name of your trait with boot, it will have it will be loaded into that boot sequence at the beginning. So when you're when you're for this example, when you're creating a new eloquent model, let's say you're creating a new blog post or you're creating a new user, when you're going to that creating phase of that eloquent model, you'll get okay, so. I know that this has already been registered while we're creating run this closure, you know, get the model, the UID attribute and add the UID to it. Nice and simple. You don't have to then add this into this part of your application or that part of your application or adding it over here and then having to do it in your test suite as well. And it gets very messy very quickly. So that is how I approach traits specifically in Laravel. Um, in other, other frameworks, maybe not so much, but when I'm using Eloquent, it's, it's just a real you know, time saver. I don't have to worry, because I know in the back of my mind that this model's already got this trait on it, and I know it's going to worry about handling the UIDs. And it can be applied to anything. You know, If you want it to do any additional behavior at any point, perfect to be used especially if that behavior is shared between different eloquent models. So observing behavior in our API is something that I was actually speaking to someone about today is how do we, you know, we want to be handling stuff in our application, in our API. Um, the idea of an API is to take a request, handle that as handle that request as quick as possible and give a response. So the client or the interface that's working with us can carry on with what it might need to be doing. You know, nobody wants to work with an API and be waiting five seconds for a response because that's just painful. It's a little bit like web requests in, in that regard. So model observers in, in Laravel is super powerful when they're used right. And sometimes, you know, like, like the example I gave in the trait, you can do the same thing in, in a model observer so this is a quick example. So consider the following scenario. An author creates a new post. And when, he, when he creates that post, he wants it to automatically publish onto the social media channels. So this is relatively normal behavior. But if let's say this is a desktop application and it's all controlled to an API, you've got a specific desktop application or an SPA that you allow your, the authors to create their content, this might feel familiar. So a simple approach to this would be to create a nice post created event, register listeners for each of those social media channels to publish to, and on each listener just post through to the API and the social media channel. And that's great. And you know, in that small application, it's fine. You know, if it's if it's you know just one person, you yourself, or maybe you know, 10 people occasionally writing a blog post and publishing that gets published out to social media. That is amazing. You know, that will work because you don't care too much about quick response times. So a slightly better approach, I'll call it. Um, a model observer handles a created event and then just dispatches a post to, to a social media job. That post to a social media job handles posting to each so social media API. Uh, you know, alternatively, the model observer could or should really dispatch a job 
to handle posting to each social media API separately. So what you're doing there, you're just going, okay, so here's my blog post. Create that blog post for me on the database. Now, Eloquent will catch that. It will start creating that. And while it's creating, it, okay, cool. So I've created this blog post. Now I want to publish to these APIs. Here's a, a background job, another background job, and another background job for LinkedIn, Twitter, and Hacker News. Perfect. Again, it's, it's a step forward from that from that first step. It's okay. So we can return early because we're just pushing things to background jobs and we can control things so we're pushing to separate APIs. And we're not just delaying that response at all for whoever's working with our API. We can quite easily just return, say, right, cool. We've accepted that request or we've created, you know, was it a publish request or was it a create this blog post request? If it's creating, a, if it's create this blog post, great. Here's a HTTP created response if you're asking them to now publish because it's been in a draft status, we've accepted that and now we're going to go see that, that process of publishing a blog post. A more advanced approach. Perhaps most people won't need this approach. So an author can select per post which channels they want to share on. And you know, not all social media channels are equal. So our model observer will then dispatch a job for each of the selected channels when it's been published to each channel, we can update on the uh, post channel relationship with meta information, such as when it was posted, a reference ID, any analytics you can start collecting. You, know, you can go as advanced as you need to this. But the, the idea of this little exercise is that return early from your API as early as you can without affecting the logic of your application. I've seen a lot of the time people start dispatching events, you know, synchronous events, and then wait for them to return, and then go into this crazy database transaction where they're getting this and they're doing that and they're storing information that came back from this API, which they had to post something off to when they got the post. And, you know, the person creating that blog post does not care what you're doing. They just want to say, hit this button, publish post, I can move on. They've probably got another one lined up if they're in a larger organization that deals with, you know, publishing things. They don't want to have to wait five seconds to get a response saying, waiting on Twitter API. Great. So now we can just sit here and just see what happens. You know, return early. So here's an example. So here's a published to Twitter job. So what we do when we construct this job, we pass in the post and we pass in the author. We serialize that, we store that in however we are working with jobs in Laravel, database, Redis, SQS, whatever that might be. And then when it's this job's time to be handled, we pull that out in the application. And what a lot of people don't know on with Laravel, especially on the job side, is it's not the constructor that the dependency injection works with on Laravel job, it's the handle method. So here's where we would inject our Twitter service and our tweet builder, for example. So we can inject things in that handle method to handle that. What I've seen a lot of people try to do is in the construct method, they're all, you know, they're passing guzzle because they know they're going to need it when it's being handled. And then they try to serialize you know, a, a configured guzzle class onto their job and try to store that on Redis. And it's just, it's not going to work. So what we then do on that handle method, we just, okay, so Twitter post, build a build. This bit is kind of like pseudo code at that point. We catch any exceptions and we just log that exception. We just die there, nice and simple. We're catching and dying because what Laravel will do in the background, if you fail to post to Twitter, it'll have a retry clause and retry again. Obviously you can't talk about APIs, you can't talk about programming and you definitely can't talk about PHP especially at a meetup without a nice hat tip to TDD. So API testing in Laravel is absolutely fantastic. It's got so many tools and you should definitely be using them. Everything past the seven dot star release has got some really good helpers for working, uh, for testing with the, the Laravel's HTTP client against third party APIs. And if you aren't already, add tests, even if they're simple, you'll thank, thank me or anyone else who says that in the long run. So even the most simple test, 
we're going to do a post endpoint test here. We're going to use database transactions because we don't really want to, you know, we want to still work with our with our database at this point. So we're going to test the collection resource endpoint status. If, yeah, if this is a super simple, does what it says on the tin test. All we're doing, we're sending a request to an API endpoint, our internal API endpoint, and we want to make sure that we're getting uh, you know, a 200 response. We want to make sure that this, this endpoint works. Countless times in the past have I built an application, maybe missed um, a semicolon, maybe done something slightly wrong. And this is mainly, I suppose, mainly before CI, CD, but I'd go to deploy that application. We'd go to test the API when it's up on the server and we'd be getting a 500 error. And there's nothing more frustrating than deploying an application, realizing you deployed a 500 error, and then thinking, if only I'd written a test. This is a test you want. This very simple test, you just want to make sure that when you're hitting that API endpoint, you're getting a response that you should be getting. Even if that is giving you an empty collection, at least your API is still working. You can work on the other side after that, you know. Again, very simple test, but if this is all you can manage to do in your testing, because you know you're under pressure, you're under budget, you you know you, you haven't got time to write the proper test suite because maybe the client doesn't believe in TDD, which again is a is the case a lot of the time. If this is the only test you can add, add it. It's worth it. Any test, even if it's a simple two-liner you could turn that into a one-liner. Even if it's this simple test, it's better than none. So what have we covered in this rant about APIs in Laravel? We've covered cleaning, cleaner models, how we can take our eloquent models and keep them clean and keep them very specific to what they're designed to be. Just because it's Laravel doesn't mean you have to write what other developers will think is Laravel code write clean code, you know, still show a little bit of respect to how you write code. Cleaning up our routing and loading for an API and how we can kind of keep that consistent and get a, a nice pattern for extending our API going forward. How are we going to declare routes and all the different many forms and finally the one that's right for you is the most important one there. There's nothing worse than going to a routes file and seeing four or five different ways to define routes. We just start, you, know, you look at it instantly and you think, oh God, what am I going to find at the other end of this root declaration? Um, a nice simple content type middleware for JSON API so you can return something consistent. Actioning a request coming into our API, API resources for consistency and how we can expand upon them if we want to. Um, how useful traits can be in a Laravel application model observers and examples of how and when we can use them, dispatching jobs to push things to the background so that we can return early in our API and handle that more intricate, maybe time consuming logic in the background and then testing how important it is. And even if it's simple, write a test, even if it is just a simple status code test, it might save your, you know, might save you sweating at some point. So again, another one of my quotes, because I like to make up quotes when I'm doing talks, it makes me feel like I should be on Wikipedia. APIs do not have to be hard, but they do have to be stateless, especially if they're REST. Only REST APIs really should add that. REST APIs do not have to be hard part. So thanks for listening. Um, if you've got comments, feedback, questions, feel free to ask now. Um, if you don't want to ask now or you just want to throw me abuse, there's my Twitter, there's my GitHub. I love having conversations about APIs. I love having conversations about PHP and Laravel and anything in general. Twitter, throw me some comments. If you don't like the talk, you do like the talk. There you go. And I will take questions now. Ollie, if you've got, if there's any in chat, would you like to read them? Yeah, it's a bit of a, a big tricky bit on chat as we've gone. There's been a few comments, people picking up your typos. Yeah, uh, a few sorry, people put a Star Wars typo. <laughs> <laughs> my typo um, is terrible. I don't have autocorrect on my desktop. 
Yeah. Lorna was a fan of Open API. We knew that anyway. We That's knew good. that. <laughs> we knew that. <laughs> Laura um, could, should probably do a talk for us on Open API. I think. I think we, should, we can we can spend all that, can't we, Lorna? Any others? Some, some discussion around whether you mentioned about not including the API prefix. So yes. there's a discussion around that. So this would be some mixed opinions on whether we should or whether we shouldn't, whether we want to put it as a API dot subdomain. So there's a bit of a discussion around that. Yeah, yeah. And I, for me, it depends a lot with that one. You know, if if what you're building for that main domain, that main kind of authoritative domain is an API, why would you prefix with an API? That, that's the way I see it. I mean, Forgive me if I'm wrong, but if unless you've got a web a web aspect to it as well, then just drop that prefix. You don't need it. They know it's an API because when they go to it, even if they accept it through the web, they're getting JSON responses. Yeah. Marvin said maybe host it as api.example.com slash v1. Um, yeah, I mean Darren, if you, if you want, with if you need so. to subdomain, totally acceptable if it's sharing the domain, but you don't always share that domain. Sometimes you've got a specific domain for an API. I know I do for some of the projects I've worked on. And you know, when it's just an API or even if it's like API dot, you still drop that prefix, right? Because you don't need the prefix if it's on a subdomain already. Yeah, I think that's the conclusion we came to. Just look here, API dot subdomain slash V1. It seems yeah. to be uh, where the agreement has come. Uh, James wants to talk about steaks or cooking. That's, you want to uh, talk about steaks and cooking? Actually, I, I did cook a, re, a uh, fillet steak again today. It was really nice, but I overcooked it. It was more kind of medium well. So I'm disappointed in myself, but it still tasted nice. So I was happy. Rob says he has a question. Yes. I don't see a Rob. I don't see a question. I don't know whether. A question from Rob. I'm, I'm starting to sweat now. The API man himself. <laughs> Can't hear you, Rob. Unmute. Do you want to unmute yourself, Rob. I'm not muted, am I? No, you weren't. We couldn't hear you. Hear you now. No. Oh, okay. Can no problem. problem. Um, authentication. Yes. It's really, really easy to get that wrong. Yes. Particularly so with things like basic auth or uh, jots or whatever the one between those two were. Um. Are there any situations when Sanctum or Passport is not the right solution? Why would you ever use anything other than those two in a Laravel app? Um, well, I mean, I I recently built a, an API, tried using Sanctum and didn't like how it worked from a front end perspective. So I was building both aspects. I was building um, the front end and the back end. So I built the API with Sanctum, then start building the front end and working with the framework as using on the front end, Sanctum just did not play nicely. So in the end, I kind of refactored to play an old JWT and smooth sailing. You know, Sanctum's great, but it's still new-ish. It, it's their approach at a little bit more than JWT, but not quite OAuth 2. So I think it's got maybe, maybe a little bit of, um, you know, production world testing that's needed. You know, let's test it in all of these different scenarios and see where we can polish it. Um, right. You know, for other things, um, can't remember the last, what was the last API I used, which was um, basic auth. I think it was stats.com was the last API I used that had basic auth. Um, and that was just like, you'd occasionally use the API to pull down you know, a chunk of data from your account, as it were. You know, I want all of this statistical data on this topic. Here's my username password, uh, uh, username password, basic, basic auth, thank you very much. You know, I don't want to worry about, let's log in or let's generate an API token and let's just grab it every now and then. I suppose it's you know, beyond JWT, if you, you, you basically want, um, Kind of your your user tokens or your HTTP basic. If one of those occasional APIs where you just kind of 
occasionally pulling data down or occasionally posting data up on a more sporadic mm. schedule than a in you know your, your typical integration but you know i think i learned most of what i know about apis from yourself so <laughs> yeah, yeah, I don't want to get your question. <laughs> yeah, I don't want to get into the discussion about it, but yeah, I think you should be very, very careful about basic auth and anything that sends a passport a password over a um, internet connection and goes yep. into logs at the other end and yep. all the other potential problems with it. Um, definitely, there are definitely some use cases. At least there were five years ago. I'm yep. less clear there are any now. Yeah. Um, I mean, Sorry. it's easier to use a, a a token over HTTP basic these days, you know, log into your yes. account, generate that token and use that as a kind of uh, authentication handshake at that point. Yes, I think tokens are most definitely the way forward in the 2020s. And yeah, uh, 2021. Only... We're forgetting 2020 existed, so we're saying for 2021. Uh, it's still not <laughs> the 405th of 2020, so. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah, I mean, Passport is good if you need it. Sanctum is good if you want to follow that route. Um, I've had teething issues with it when I'm integrating with it. And okay. you know, I suppose when I build APIs, I'm usually working with a, you know, either myself on the front end or someone else, and we work closely, and I just want to save myself the headaches because they're going to hit the problems I have before. Yes, and that's a different scenario as well because you are making the front end and the back end which is different to other scenarios where you have third parties integrating with your API. Yeah. If it's and again, just a tokens API are what we're and doing. you don't care what they do. Cool. You sanctum and away you go. Yeah, that was it. Just oh. we had to preach the token thing. No, def definitely agree there. I mean, I couldn't not mention HTTP basic course without, you know, when I, I could have done all API authentication, I guess. Um, we could pretend it never existed. It's fine. It was great in the 1980s and 1990s. We could pretend PHP 4 never existed. <laughs> Any other questions? Or have you all heard me ramble and jitter around for long enough? Uh, it's just comments about testing, but we should also test the structure probably of the request or the uh, set of the response. So the code, yeah, that yep. makes sense to me. Uh, yeah, I mean, the, the yeah. test example was literally devil's advocate. If you can't, if you don't have time or budget to do any tests, at least add this into one line test so that you know that at least you're not getting, you know, a 400 or a, a 403 or you know, any other response from that, from that endpoint. Okay, I think, I think we're done. Cool, well, thank you very much for listening, everyone. Any questions or comments, then feel free, I'm on Twitter. Otherwise, I'm gonna hand you all back to my lovely assistant, Oliver. <laughs>